as my regular viewers know, I am a certified history nut. It is my favorite thing to read about. It was my favorite subject in school. And recently, a book fell into my lap, Antebellum and Civil War San Francisco. So I sought out the author, and she's our guest today, author and tour guide Monica Trobitz. I'm here to tell you in person, I loved your book. Thank because you. Because I learned things I had never known before. Talk to us about how significant the American Civil War was to San Francisco. The American Civil War, many people think of as an East Coast event. But in fact, the East Coast came to San Francisco in search of gold, in search of riches. And the Northerners and the Southerners, who were unlikely to have met each other otherwise, met up here. This was the common ground with the common quest to get rich. And of course, separated by an entire continent. Of course, of course, nothing but territories in between. You had the East Coast way in the East, you had us all the way out here by our lonesome in the West. Now one of the things that I found fascinating about your book was that in many ways the leadership, the power structure of San Francisco before the American Civil War was very southern leaning. It was indeed, although they comprised only 20 percent of the population. 62 percent was weighted toward the north. And that kind of played out in the elections. But in terms, in terms of the power structure, definitely the southerners had their fingers and their feet into everything. So the, the battle over states' rights, the battle over slavery was being fought out here also in the streets and yes. in the bar rooms yes. uh, and in the back rooms of San Francisco, correct? And in duels. And in duels. Well, you know, talk to me about that. There were actually some deaths here oh, yes. uh, as a direct result of the conflict between North and South. Very definitely. And the one big one that everyone knows about is the famous Broderick Terry duel, which took place down at Lake Merced. They went way out to that part of the city because duels were outlawed here, not only by the state constitution, but locally. So they went way out to what we now know, call as, you know, the outside lands, way out there. So they could fight the duel, uh, and they, they were stopped by the sheriff initially they came back the next day after the judge told them duels are not permitted here and they said yes your honor and they went out in the hallway and had a little powwow and reconvened the next morning and who were these two people that shot each other and and who got the uh, the worst end of the stick or the gun I should uh, say well David Broderick who was a northerner uh, a free soiler an abolitionist uh, and uh, David Terry, who was the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court of all things, and he resigned his position so that he could fight in the duel. So it was the War of the Davids, and it started because of a very inflammatory speech that Terry gave up in Sacramento, which was carried in the local papers. Broderick read about it, responded in kind, it went back and forth, and David Terry demanded satisfaction. And that led us to the duel of September 13th, uh, 1859. And who died and who didn't? Well, Terry and, and, and Broderick uh, um, did not shoot simultaneously. What happened was that Broderick's gun went off prematurely. It had been rigged, supposedly, and he didn't realize it had a hair trigger and he hit the ground. What they should have done at that point was say, okay, wait a minute, we need to start over. Instead, David T Terry raises his gun and shoots David Broderick point blank in the chest, hitting them in the left lung. He lingered for three days, and then he finally died. A very painful death, 39 years old. Wow. You know, one of the stories that I found most compelling and completely new to me was the importance of, well, I think many people would still say the most significant theater family in United States yes. history, yes. the Booth family. Yes. And, of course, uh, uh, Booth is known as being the uh, James Wilkes, uh, John, Wilkes. John Wilkes Booth, yes. the assassin of Abraham Lincoln. But his father and his brothers were quite well known as uh, actors, yes. and they performed here in San Francisco. They did, and that's what really led to the writing of this book. And they are the bookends for the story because the story both begins and ends with the Booth family. Now, I want to be clear that John Wilkes never came out to San Francisco. He was not known to go any further than New Orleans, but his family did. His brothers and his father, who was a classic Shakespearean actor. Junius Booth. All, Junius Senior. Yeah. And there was also a Junius Junior who lived out here up on Telegraph Hill for 13 years. And then there was Edwin, the star of the family, the rock star of his generation theatrically, and all his work 
and his reputation was undone by what his brother John Wilkes did in April of 1865. Right. Something else that was uh, especially to me moving and, and, and sad was the story of many African Americans here yes. in San Francisco and how they had come here from the American South thinking they had escaped the prejudice and the bigotry oh, no. and the slavery of the South to find it reenacted here on the streets of San Francisco. Talk to me about that and specifically one of the people who I find most fascinating in your book, Mary Ellen Pleasant, correct? Mary Ellen Pleasant, yes. Uh, her origins are murky. It's thought that she uh, was born on a plantation in Georgia, although she always said she came from Philadelphia. Uh, but she did come out west and she got involved uh, with helping blacks out here in the west. She operated an underground railroad helping them to get uh, incorporated into San Francisco society. She positioned many of them in the houses of the movers and the shakers and told them, keep your ears and eyes open and let me know what's going on there. So she kept up with what was happening here behind closed doors. She became known as the mother of the civil rights movement in California, and justifiably so. She, she made and lost a for fortune and died in, po in poverty here in 1904. I mean, she died in poverty, but she died, you said, 1904, she yes. was at quite advanced age. I she mean, was in her 90s. So, I mean, quite a history for oh, this yes, woman. Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, one of the p things that you talk about in the book was an episode, and I'm going to get it wrong. Mm. It's been a, uh, several weeks since I finished the book. But there was an attempted escape by a freed slave yes. that Mary Allen Pleasant was very involved in. Yes. It became kind of a, a real cause celebra right. and involving uh, an escape on a ship out yes. to the Golden Gate. Yes. Uh, Archie Lee had been brought to California uh, by his master. Uh, Archie did not realize that California was a free state. Any of the slaves who were brought west, by the way, they were never told that. They did not understand that this was a free state. Slavery had been banned constitutionally. So some of their quote unquote owners took advantage of, of that. Of course, And absolutely. just said, well, even though they were legally free here, they right. still treated them like chattel. Absolutely. And it was the son of that master, that owner, uh, who tried to take Archie Lee out of California and back to the Old South. And uh, this began a battle here, out at sea, <laughs> where there, there were people on the, on the ship, on the boat, uh, wanting to keep Archie Lee on so they could take him out, and there were others trying to get him off. It was this, this struggle out there, and finally the police, the local police, did get Archie Lee off. And uh, Edward uh, Baker, who was a very prominent attorney here at the time, uh, defended his interests in court, and Mary Ellen Pleasant uh, hit him in one of her homes, her many homes, and finally helped Archie Lee to escape up to Canada and he lived the rest of his life right. up in Canada. Now, in a very real sense, statehood for California was the tipping point towards the American Civil War, correct? Yes, because before that, the balance in the Senate was half free states, yes. half slave states. Talk to me a little bit about that and the direct result of California statehood. Well, Senator John Calhoun uh, of, of Mississippi was the loudest voice in the Senate in, in favor of expanding slavery to the West. Uh, I have to mention one thing here. We had a Mexican-American war in the mid-1840s, and it was the Polk administration, uh, James K. Polk's administration, that was the driving force behind that war, and it was the Southerners in the Senate who were influencing him, and the idea was to expand slavery to the West. Plantation farming is very hard on the land. They wanted more land, they wanted fresh land, and they looked to the West for that. But first they had to wrestle what had been known as Alta California away from Mexico. And Alta California is now the present states of, of California and the southwestern states. So once the war was won, the next thing that happens is that California wants to become a state, and this was the coastal part of Alta California because that's where all the population was. And this began a very big battle in the Senate because, of course, they didn't want an additional free state. They had maintained that equilibrium for years. There were 15 free states, 15 slaves. There was, uh, fl uh, pardon me, 15 slave states. And there was some discussion about breaking this landmass of California in half and giving half and half. But in the end, it stayed together. And after a big battle in Congress, in the Senate, but see, a few things happen. Calhoun dies. He dies, so the loudest voice is out of the picture. And uh, after that, Henry Clay, who was a great compromiser, got through a series of resolutions that would give to the North, give to the South, and give to the West in the form of allowing California to enter as the 31st state. And it was the balance that tipped it towards Absolutely. more freed states Absolutely. than in slave a way, states. You know, David, in a way it bought time, and in another way 
it pushed us further toward the war. Right. California comes in as a free state, and every state that followed in the 1850s and during the war itself entered as a free state. So that hold that the Southerners in the Senate had was lost. And right. Calhoun knew that, and that's why he fought against it. He knew once the doors opened, that would be it. You know, San Francisco and Northern California, California has gotten a reputation for being a place that celebrates diversity. Mm -hmm. And specific to this show, the LGBT community, yes. the book doesn't talk about it, but it's kind of between the lines yes. I read that San Francisco for many years was basically an all-male yes, town. Yes. How how does that reality impact the LGBT community and LGBT history? I know you talked about lavender cowboys. Talk yes. a little bit about that. Well, uh, it was all male. The population in 1850, for example, is estimated to have been at about 30,000. Of that 30,000, only 300 were women and two-thirds were prostitutes. <laughs> so it was a male-dominated po population roughly between the ages of 19 and the early 40s. Gay men were part of the landscape. They were part of the landscape here and throughout the Old West. In those days, if you were a man with effeminate qualities, you would be referred to as a lavender cowboy. <laughs> and what was their life like? I mean, was it completely cruel or was there some sort of, well, I mean, we're all in this together, let's just let people be people? Initially, it was we're all in this together because the common quest was for gold, to get rich, to go back home and be wealthy and no longer have to go back to the miserable job that you may have left. So I don't think that those sorts of issues were big factors, perhaps later on, but not during the gold rush years. Right. We've only got a few moments left, and I know you've brought something here, a little oh, artifact, yes. uh, since, of course, central to your story and that time period was... Uh, President Abraham Lincoln. Absolutely. And this is not an actual artifact, but a recreation. This what is, is a this? reproduction. This was a very popular to uh, toy during the Lincoln administration. He was elected in 1860, and by the way, won the state of California because of San Francisco, which was voting heavily, heavily in his favor. But this was a toy that became very popular, and what you had to do here is you had to get this little ball in Lincoln's top hat. <laughs> and I, I, I'll invite you to oh, try my it. I'll invite I don't know. you well, to try it because yeah. it's, it's, I'm yeah, telling I'm not, you, nobody's ever been able to do well, it. Well, no, actually, I'm, I'm just, there you go. Yeah, there you go. That's how you do it. You see, that's, that's how you That's go. how you put the, yes. the ball in Lincoln's hat. Absolutely. So I've won the election. Yes, you have. You have. <laughs> We've been speaking with Monica Trobitz, tour guide and author of Antebellum and Civil War San Francisco, and now someone who might have been interested in help edit this book, although she did a great job on her own the so-called sexy grammarian, making syntax sensual. We'll be right back. <laughs>